So I'm going to start with a little bit of a background for uh, those of you that weren't weren't here last week. Um, so we're we're the Beatitudes. They're uh, a series of of statements. You know, blessed uh, are those who are poor in spirit, or who mourn, and they're a, a little bit. Uh, certainly, they were for me initially very uh, hard to understand. They're kind of contradictory. And so what do we do when we, when we have, when we come across a passage in, in Scripture that is hard to understand? Well, we, we are very blessed that we have, we have the Holy Spirit, so we, we can pray and ask, ask the Holy Spirit to help give us insight. We can use the, the, uh, the context of the passage, what's going on, to help understand what, uh, who the intended audience was and, and and what was going on in the in history? We can uh, we want to interpret scripture using scripture. So when we have uh, a passage that's hard to understand, we want to look for passages that are more plain, more more easily understood. And because scripture does not contradict itself, we can use those scriptures that are easier to understand to interpret and understand and gain insight into the the ones that are a little more difficult. And uh, I, I also, it's helpful to me, I like to look at, uh, look at the original words, the Greek and Hebrew, and sometimes that, that will also help uh, give additional insight. You know, some of these, these words that are, tran we have very good translations, but sometimes uh, when we go back to the original words, we can see some more, some more facets and, and more, more details. Um, so this is the 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 beginning, the the basis, basically the introduction to the first sermon that's recorded for us in in the book of Matthew that uh, we know is the the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes are just this this first part that that intro introduces and, and launches into the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I would uh, you know I, I I believe it's really the the foundation that the Sermon on the Mount is, is built on. And uh, that uh, that Jesus was talking to his disciples, also to to the crowd, and th that uh, I, I believe this is a message for for us as well as uh, both believers and um, a, a, an example of of what we should strive for, strive to be. So. When we look at the the word beatitude, that's not a not a word that uh, I'm you know rolling off my tongue every week. You know, but uh, looking at that, it, it's basically it's a, a word for s supreme blessedness. And when we look at the the word that was used and and is translated as blessed are the the poor in spirit, blessed are the those who who mourn, blessed are the meek. It's uh, really uh, the, the the idea is that. Uh, we're supremely blessed. We we um, we're fortunate. We're well off. We're we're blessed. We're happy. And uh, as I as I mentioned last week, this is uh, a, a lot of it was used in some of the old uh, you know Greek texts to to describe uh, a happiness that is essentially independent of of circumstances. So. Um, I, I, that's a a distinction that I've kind of grown up taking as kind of a difference between happiness and joy. That uh, you know we kind of say when when we have joy, that's more of a, like an inner happiness that uh, is you know doesn't matter what's going on circumstantially, we can still have that that inner happiness, and and that's the the idea here is that if. Uh, ba you know, essentially, if if these describe us, we will have we will have that that inner happiness, and we we look at uh, who is who is telling us this. It is uh, you know Jesus Christ. It is our 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 Creator, our Maker, and who better to uh, you know tell us what uh, what will what actually give us joy, will give us uh, deep happiness than than our Creator. So, as we uh, look at the uh, the Beatitudes, uh, I think I, I mentioned last week that uh, Spurgeon he he talked about the the Beatitudes as being like a ladder. 
So there, there is an order to the Beatitudes and the way that they are laid out. They do uh, lead one to the next, and they, they start with uh, the poor in spirit and then progress to those who mourn and then the, the meek and then, and then hunger and thirsting for righteousness. And those are the ones that we covered last week. And uh, basically, I, I, uh, I, I believe that these are uh, not just kind of earthly things, but these are, are intended to be more deeply understood to be spiritual uh, attributes and that they are to be uh, essentially describing us as, as believers, that they should describe us. We, we have to come to the Lord poor in spirit, not, uh, not offering something to God, not, uh, not taking pride in, in that we come to church, that we pray, that we fast, that we tithe our money, but we are just sinners that miraculously God will forgive if we, you know, when, when we repent and, and he will, we come to our, to our Savior with nothing to offer. The, the idea of the poor there is beggar. We're begging God, you know, Lord, please ha- have, have mercy on us. And that when we, when we have that spirit, when we approach God that way, we begin to see also more our sin and the sin that is in our lives. And, and we, we are mourning over our sin and mourning over our sin, we, we, are, we are comforted. And that as we, as we mourn over our sin, then we, we cultivate an attitude of, of meekness, of, of being useful. So meekness, the idea of being a power that's under control and that we are being submissive to, to our Lord. We're, we're, we're letting God work through us and Ha- let his power work through us and be useful to our Lord. And then we, we become, we, as we're useful to God, we're, we're hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And we, we want to ha- be, we want righteousness that is basically our, our spiritual food, just like normal food and water we, are, we need for, for our physical body. We, we, we need righteousness for our spiritual life, and that that's where we where we left off last week there's i believe a kind of a, a bit of an inflection point here in our in our ladder or or stairs uh, progression of the beatitudes where the these these first four are are really kind of describing a bit of, of of kind of how we're how we how we respond and 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 work or uh, yeah respond to an encounter with God and now that we have we're 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 taking righteousness in and we are changing and and our lives start to be start to be uh, exemplified. Or, or we start to, to show mercy and, and p- having a pure heart and being peacemakers. So this, um, this is um, the, the idea is that we are transformed as, as, we're, as we're taking in righteousness. And these are not, not natural attributes for us humanly. Uh, some, some, I think we... Some people are maybe naturally a little merciful, but not for the right reasons. Uh, I, I, I would, I would uh, suggest. So, getting into our our passage, verse seven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And as we uh, as trying to think about what what is mercy, and, and looking at this this word. Uh, the I think we, we generally think of mercy as not getting what we deserve, right? So th- th- there's something that that we are guilty of, and there's consequences and uh, for those for that, and 
basically getting off. And something that uh, may maybe m most of you can, can re relate to, you know, the, the when I was uh, in younger, a younger man, uh, I was uh, driving my parents' vehicle one time, and uh, I was driving in, in the, the small, uh, the town where, where I was going to, going to school, and just cruising along, minding my own business, and all of a sudden, I see the, uh, those nice, friendly uh, red and blue lights in, in the rearview mirror. And sure enough, exceeding the speed limit, I was guilty, right? Pull over, ha have all that uh, very nervous interaction, and was was very relieved when I got off with a warning. Right, I, I was shown mercy. It was not I didn't deserve to get a warning because I was breaking the law, but but I had I was I was shown mercy, and so I think I, I've been kind of thinking about mercy in, in those terms and, and thinking, okay, you really need to be in a position of authority to show mercy, right? So, so is this talking only to people that, you know, to police officers and, and to judges and, and, and people of authority, or is this a message for, for all of us, um, you know, in, in whatever position we, we are, we're in? And I, I believe that this is for, for all of us, um, we, we have, um, I think the, the idea of, of grace as well, uh, that I think it, my, I'm used to thinking of grace as more like getting something that you don't deserve, that grace is a gift, getting something that you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting something that you do deserve, something bad that you don't, that you you deserve, and but I think those are those are really kind of two sides to the same coin, and that we we uh, we can be merciful, uh, not just if we're in a position of authority, but if if there's if someone else, um, I know this might be surprising, but if someone wrongs us or, or does something uh, you know sins against us or offends us, we. Can and and they you know we're we're we might be, you know they they actually did do something wrong, and we can show mercy by by forgiving them and not not holding them uh, accountable, and we can we can look uh, I think a good example of this back in the Old Testament with uh, David and Saul. So this is in First Samuel chapter twenty four. So this is. Saul was the, the king of Israel, right? But this is after David and Saul. They, they've known each other for a while. They've already had the, the Philistines and Goliath and, and all of that. And then kind of their relationship kind of soured a little bit. Saul started throwing spears at David and uh, doing th those types of uh, you know, aggressive activities. And uh, and then also, this is after David has, has actually been anointed king. So David is, is now the, you know, I guess from, he has been anointed king. He knows that it's God's plan for him to be king. And Saul is still chasing him. And you, you, you probably are, are familiar with the story, but uh, that Saul is chasing David. And uh, he's he's got uh, three thousand men from all Israel and went to seek David, and his men in front of the the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheep's fold on the way where there was a cave, and Saul went in to to uh, to relieve himself. And um, now David and his men were sitting in the inner recesses of the cave. The men of David said to him, "Behold." This is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give, you, give your enemy into your hand. So his men are saying, All right, David, this is it. This is your time to, to strike, and now you can be the, the, the full king of, of Israel. And you shall do to him as it seems good, for, good to you. Then David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. It came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him 
because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord. Talking about Saul. The, the Lord's anointed. So Saul was also the anointed king before David. To stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against him. Rise up against Saul. And Saul rose and left the cave and went on his way. So, so David had, had mercy on, on Saul not not necessarily because of something that uh yeah not at all because of you know he was wanting Saul to be his friend or or anything like that he he was had mercy out of respect and reverence for for God and so i, I think this is a a for for us as well i think we you know sometimes we might be tempted to have have mercy on on people for you know that that we can get something out of it later, right? Now you owe me. You, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call in this this uh, favor later, and I, I'd say that is that is not the the biblical attitude of of mercy. In uh, Romans chapter five, um, I think we we see why does why does God show mercy to us? Why does God show mercy to us? God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it is, God shows his, love to, uh, his mercy to us out of his love. And we see with David, he, he is showing mercy to his enemy as well, Saul, out of David's love and and respect for for God. And and what happens if if we if we don't show mercy, if we are not not merciful. So in in Matthew chapter 18 we we have a uh, a parable that that's told and it's a a a, a disturbing parable. Uh, but Matthew chapter 18 starting in verse 21. This is a uh, Peter is talking, you know, with, with the disciples talking to Jesus, and, and Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times? So, so Peter's starting off by saying, you know, okay, if, I, if someone sins against me, I forgive them. They do, they sin against me again, I forgive them, you know, so now we're up to two times. Sin again, okay, I'll forgive you again three times. Do that seven times, and then, then we're good, right, Jesus? And, you know, which is uh, pretty, pretty generous, right? Seven times. But, uh, but Jesus said to him, I do not say, that, say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So we forgive <laughs> and forgive and forgive. And then Jesus goes into this, this, uh, this parable. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who has wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents. So that, this is essentially like a, a huge amount. This is, uh, the, my understanding is a talent is basically their, their largest denomination that they had. And 10,000 is kind of the, the terminology that they would use for infinite, you know, a trillion dollars, you know, this is a, kind of some hyperbole here, this is that basically he owed more than a lifetime's worth of, of money to this king. So one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, but since he did not have the means to repay this, this huge debt, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children, and that, that all that he had and repayments to be made. So the slave fell on the ground, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay everything. And he ends up, he is forgiven. And then the, the Lord felt, uh, felt, had compassion. And then what does he do? He leaves the, after being forgiven this, this infinite debt. And 
Verse 28, but then, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. So this, my understanding, is about three months' wages, so much more manageable debt, but still a, a, a decent amount. He owed him a hundred denarii, and the slave that had just been forgiven, he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell on the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me, I will repay you. But he was unwilling. So he had the same response. He's you know, asking you know, for patience, but the, the slave that was forgiven was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should be paid back what he was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were g- deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, the Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the time that I had mercy on you? And as the Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers that he should repay all that he owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. So, again, th- this is a parable. This is, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily take every piece of this, but we, we take the, 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 the lesson from this nonetheless. Um, I, I, verse 35 is, is a very difficult um, verse. So, I, I want to, you know, my, my understanding of this is essentially when we truly understand what, what we have been forgiven, that we've been forgiven this, this huge debt that is, is un, unpayable by, by ourselves, that we then, ha- we, we understand that we then extend mercy to others. When others offend us and, and sin against us, or you know, we we then extend that mercy to them, and just to to be clear, I, this is this is not a um, this is not something that is saying that our salvation is dependent on forgiving others. Right? We we know that our our salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. It's it's not a result of works. It's not this is not something that uh, you know we have to forgive. This is. This, this, I believe, is the, res- the, the result of our salvation. This is the, the works that, that flow out of, out of our faith, out of our salvation. We will be, we will be merciful. We will be for- forgivers. And I think the, 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 you know, why do we forgive? Why do we forgive? And I, I go back to... Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, the, the chapter about love. Love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. So that, that sounds like that forgiveness, that mercy, right? Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So we we have the... I think it really is out of love for for God, as as uh, David exemplified, and also love for for others. And that's a uh, that, that kind of sounds familiar, right? What does Jesus tell us? The the two greatest commandments are: love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And second is like it: love love your neighbor as yourself. So. I think we we are merciful when we have when we understand the mercy that has been shown to us by God, and when we are living out the the commandments, when we are we are showing love to both our God when we're merciful, and we're showing love to to our brothers and sisters when we are when we are merciful. All right, we're all the way to verse eight now. So, <laughs> blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, this uh, this word "pure," it, uh, it's 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 translated about about equally half and half in in the Bible as pure and clean. So the the idea the pure or clean heart it's uh, free from 
from corrupt desires, free from, from sin and guilt. So in, in, my, uh, in my day job, I, I am a, a rotor dynamics engineer, and we, so we deal with, uh, deal with uh, high-speed rotating equipment, and there's, there's a different materials. A lot of times they're, 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 you know, these are turbines and, and things that are operating in a very, uh, very difficult environment, very hot and high pressure, high speed, so highly stressed. And, and there's an idea that for, for metals and materials that are used for, for non-rotating parts, of, of an engine or a motor, they they uh, they can be made out of uh, just kind of a, a, a standard grade of of materials. A lot of times we'll use the same materials, ink canals and and uh, mnemonics, and, and we'll use those same materials as rotor grade as as for the rotating parts as well. When we use them as a, uh, for a rotating part. We actually want to use not just the, the standard grade, we want to use the, the rotor grade material. And normally that, that involves uh, the material being melted additional times. So, so they talk, we, we, we use materials that have been melted three times. So they, they get heated up. And the reason why, why we do that, why we have rotor grade and, and regular stator grade is when we go through that that melt process multiple times, the the small impurities, the things that uh, are the elements that we don't really want in there in the the material, they get basically burned burned off and burned out. And um, while that doesn't sound like a necessarily a, a a very comfortable process, that is the what what we want, right? We want to be purified. We want our 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 heart to to be um, to be clean, and how does our how does our heart how does our heart start off? We we see in, in the the Old Testament and the New Testament that uh, in Jeremiah our, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? In Matthew fifteen, for out of the heart comes good things, happy things. The we're just good people that. Are in an evil world. No, out of out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. And this is something. Um, those of you that uh, that don't have have children, you 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 probably think that uh, you know step one when, when our kids are born, the first thing we start doing is is teaching them how to be disrespectful and and how to uh, how to say no and throw fits and how to how to be selfish <laughs> right <laughs> the 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 truth is that 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 sin nature is in is, we're born with it right we we're, we're we're all born with it our our heart starts off the opposite of of pure and clean but we have we have good news. We have good news. In in Ezekiel and many other places, right? We see that the Lord He will give us a new heart and put a new spirit within within us, within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So He He will, when we are when we are born again, right? We are given a, a we are a new creation, and that is. Is is when we we have a, a heart that is that can be called pure, right? We we are forgiven, and and God looks on the the heart the the, the blood of Christ instead of seeing the the sinful um, nature that 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 we have naturally. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So, what uh, peace is a, a fairly fairly straightforward, but but what kind of peace are we talking about here? Are we are we talking about the the peace between nations? Right? Did are, are we talking about the making making peace in in the Middle East? Are we you know between the Israelis and and the 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 Arab nations? Are we are we talking about 
you know, kind of just the finding peace within our within ourselves, being, you know, finding uh, like nirvana or something, you know, finding, you know, being at peace individually? Are we talking about, uh, are we talking about what, what I believe we're talking about here is the, the Messiah's peace and this, this idea of um, that we are, we start off, we're enemies with God, but that through, through Christ and, and, and his, his sacrifice, we can have peace with, with God, with our Lord. So when we, when we first, you know, kind of look at, look at things here, trying to figure this out, we, we see that uh, in Matthew, Jesus is talking about uh, that, uh, do you think that I came to bring peace to the earth? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, and then in John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace. So how, how, do, we, how do we reconcile this, right? And I, th- I believe that it is exactly that, right? Jesus did not come to bring peace to the nations, peace you know, political peace. He he came to to uh, give you give us his his peace, and my peace I give to you, not as not as the world gives you. Do I give you? Do not uh, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. So uh, there there certainly there there are verses that talk about you know we are to to live peacefully with with men and you know with our you know with the world as much as it's possible but that uh that i don't think that's what this 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 verse is is talking about exactly as being peacemakers in Romans chapter 5 verse 1 and, and also in Ephesians, in, in Romans, we see, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then also in Ephesians, we, we see, and having shod your feet, so this is when we're talking about the, uh, the armor of God, and uh, we're talking about shod, uh, putting, on the, the, putting on your feet, with preparations for the gospel of peace, right? So I, I think this is, this is the the right idea here, right? We're we're to to be proclaiming how we can how we can have peace, how how sinners can have peace with God, and in in Colossians chapter one, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace. Let's see if I can use the pointer here. Peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And in, in uh, James chapter 3, we see as well, in the seed whose fruit is righteousness, righteousness we were, we were talking about earlier, hungering for righteousness, the, the seed whose, whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So those who make peace, the, the peacemakers, are sowing the seeds that that produce this peace. So the blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, I, I, I believe it is truly talking about uh, us proclaiming the gospel and allowing sinful men and women to to have have peace with 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 our God and being being reconciled. All right, so doing all right here. So verse 10, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And persecuted, persecution is something, certainly for myself, I, I think is, is kind of a, a hard thing to really be made real to me. Right, because we we are incredibly blessed. We we are not, uh, r- you know, ex- experiencing certainly the persecution for our our religious beliefs that that are are 
you know, that our, uh, you know, spiritual fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers have experienced, you know, where they were, where they were persecuted to the, to the point of death. And, and persecution, th- this word ha- has the idea of um, being made to run so that, you know, being chased, chased after and, and basically kind of, you know, running for your life, being, being persecuted, being chased. The, the, this is something that, you know, certainly we don't thankfully have the same, at the same level that the early church and, you know, in the, the years past have experienced, but we, we, are, we are told that, that you know, we, there, there, there will be persecution. We're, we're, we're told to expect it. And the, the one thing that, that uh, one, one of the things that I point out is that, that we're, we're not to be persecuted and because of, um, like, just our, our attitudes or, or, you know, because we're, you know, hard to get along with or, or because, you know, we, we be persecuted for, like, our political beliefs or, or, or anything like that. We're to be persecuted. It's, we're, the blessing is only when we're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And this, this word righteousness this is the the same the same righteousness the same word that we saw back in in verse 6 where this is the same righteousness that we're hungering for we're hungering for this righteousness and yet it will result in persecution but we still hunger for it even even when when we are persecuted so uh, talking about you know expecting persecution, Second Timothy we see indeed indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So this is this is something that uh, I think honestly I, I kind of struggle with a little bit because uh, I feel like for the most part I'm I'm not persecuted. You know the 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 little things that I can point to. You know that you know oh yeah I, I can experience some you know see some shame or, you know, some embarrassment maybe, you know, that, that people think that, uh, you know, that I, it's, it's kind of, you know, almost like, you know, oh, it's cute that you believe in, in, in the Bible, that that's good that that helps you sleep at night, right? And so there may be like a, a, a very small sense of, you know, uh, of kind of, you know, worldly shame, but, but that's not, you know, I, I, that's not real persecution, right? The we're um, yeah, we're, so we're we're inc- incredibly blessed, but I, I think that uh, there the way that our our culture is going, there there are people that are being more heavily persecuted and are you know having to make decisions that affect their employment and you know affect their their ability to. To provide for for themselves and their family, um, because of of the stands that that, that they're taking for righteousness, um, and and I, I think the 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 reason why we are persecuted, right? Why why would someone be persecuted for showing mercy, for being a peacemaker, for for um, yeah, ha- having a pure heart? Why why would why would that because we we are we are exposing sin when when we are are living righteously and when we are are preaching the gospel and and making you know sowing those seeds of righteousness and we 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 know from ourselves our own history and we know also from the word that when when we're when we're in sin like we like the darkness we 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 want to hide we don't want to be exposed and say, "Oh yeah, yeah, I'm a sinner, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm rotten." We we want people to to agree and say, "Oh, it's it's not so bad." But why do we why do we continue on even in the face of persecution? Right? Why why do, why would what would what would drive us to do that? In Galatians chapter one, so this is this is Paul talking. He's saying. 
I, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only, but only they, they kept hearing, they, they kept hearing the, the churches. He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. Right? Why, why do we, why, what is the, what I would say, the, the right attitude to endure this persecution? Because those same people that are persecuting us, they can, they can be revived, rejuvenated. They can, they can have new life. They can, they can be, they can have peace with, with our God. And, and whenever there is a, 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 a new soul that's joined to our church, we all rejoice and glorify God. We'll look at Second Corinthians chapter four. How, how do we how do we endure? You know, we we endure in in Second Corinthians chapter four. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus. So they're they're sowing those seeds of righteousness. They're So they, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthly vessels, so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God, and not ourse- from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about the body of the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So we, we endure the persecution because we are not forsaken. God is with us, and, and he is strengthening us, and he is, he is working through us. There, there's, um, you know, as, as, we, as we think about some of the persecutions that, that, and things that the saints have, have faced before us, being, you know, martyred, put to death, the, you know, I, I think in, in my mind that, that if, it, if it came to it, that I would be, I would be faithful, that I would be able to, to withstand the persecution. But I, I haven't been tested. I don't. I don't really. I don't really know. And I. I also. I, I don't know. I, I. I like to think that I can, but I don't. I don't know. And I think the reality is, it, it wouldn't be myself. There's a, a, tre- a tremendous book that that I read uh, recently. I should have read a long time ago. Uh, the Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. And just a, a, an amazing saint and an amazing example. And she tells the story in, in the book. So she, they, they basically, they, in a nutshell, they, they hid Jews from the Nazis during World War II and ended up being discovered and ended up being taken into a concentration camp for, for a while. And fortunately, she, she survived. Her, her father and sister did not. Um, but she survived and, and has an incredible testimony, incredible witness. But she, she relates a story of when she, was, when she was young, a family friend died. And she was talking to her father about, you know, uh, basically, I, I couldn't stand it, stand it. She had fear that if her father died. And she was saying, I, I wouldn't be able to make it if, if, if you died. And her father told her a story about... Uh, gave her basically a parable, an illustration of when they would go on train rides, he would say, when, you know, we go and I buy the ticket for you and for myself, when do, when do I give you the ticket to, for the train? He said, I, I carry the ticket for you from the, from the ticket person. I carry it through the, the train station. We get on the train, I'm still carrying it. When the conductor comes by to collect the tickets, I hand you the ticket just in time for you to hand it to the conductor. And 
he, her father told her, God is the same way, right? We have, you know, there, there's, there's things that we will face in our life that we have no idea how, how we would have the ability to, to live through and to honor God in. But my faith, if, I do, if it does come to, you know, very bad persecution, is that God will get, hand me the ticket in time for me to, to walk through that, that trial, that, that persecution. Now, our, our last beatitude here. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I really think this is, this is like the, uh, the capstone. This is the, like the stake at the end. This is the, um, you know, before the, all of the, the previous Beatitudes is being saying, blessed are those, blessed are they, blessed are this very kind of generic, you know, the, the, you know, the millions of people that, that are, you know, are in the, the church and will be saved. And then this is the one where it basically the, kind of the camera pans from this wide angle to zooms right in, and there's my face, right? And there's your face. This is, this is it's not just the church is blessed when it, they're persecuted. It's, it's me and it's you. And um, the, the, in, in John chapter 15, we see that, again, illustrated that, that it's basically this is, we are the... You know, they, they persecuted Jesus. He is our master. They're, we're to expect that they're, they're going to persecute us as well in, individually. So as we uh, wrap things here, the, we have this, this idea that the, the Beatitudes being this progression. So we start in poor in spirit. We, we, come, we have an encounter with God. We don't have pride in ourselves or in our, our own abilities, our own accomplishments, but we are, are fully reliant on God. We're, we're a beggar before him saying, have mercy. We, we see our sin. We mourn over our sin. We are, we are grateful. We, we are comforted. We are forgiven. We are, are meek before our God. We, we want to be used by him. And and we 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 start to we hunger and thirst for righteousness, and then that that results and and flows in being being merciful because of the mercy that was exalted or was was bestowed on us, being being having a, a purified heart, a clean heart, a new heart, and being a new creation, and being being peacemakers, making peace w- between man and God and God. That uh, people, men and women, that don't know the Lord, and then the result of of that that righteousness, that living righteously, is that we will be persecuted. Um, there, there's there's a lot more, <laughs> but uh, the this this is a a, a very exciting passage. Um, I, I I don't I don't know about you, but uh, see reading this and and this kind of being being the standard, being the the example. It is such a high bar, right? This is, you know, I, I'm much more comfortable like being like the Pharisee that, that's just saying, you know, thank you, Lord, that I'm not like, you know, that guy over there, right? Th- but that's not, that's completely the wrong attitude. Um, uh, John MacArthur, when he was talking about the, the Beatitudes, he, he said, you know, after studying them, he's like, this, this is like a, a stained glass window, right? This is like, basically, you know, perfection. This is something that, that we're to attain to, and we're like, wh- where am I, God? What, what am I? You know, this, is, this is where I, where I should be, but this is not where I am. And the, yeah, certainly I, I, can, I can echo that as well, that this is, this is a very intimidating standard, <laughs> and we can only attain, we can only strive towards this in steps. And, and we don't want to be like the Pharisee that we talked about last week, that saying, you know, thank you, God, that I'm not like the, the tax collector. I, I think the, the right attitude is that, that we should be looking at this and, and kind of having periodic, you know, maintenance on ourselves and saying, okay, Lord, am I, you know, where do I need to, to change my alignment to be more in line with, with the example that you have? And the Lord willing that we can say, Lord, 
thank you that I'm not like I was last year, that I'm not the same person that I was last year, that I, the same person that I was a month ago, that I'm, I'm growing. I'm, this is a sanctification process that we are growing and becoming more and more uh, conformed to the, this example. And that, that's, that's why we, we have you know, kind of our, our, char- our church motto, right, is come as you are, but become more like Jesus, right? That, that's, that's, what, that's why we're here, right? We want to be fed by the, the word. We want to be growing spiritually into more the image, the, the, the people that God wants us to be so that we can be more, more useful to God, that we can, we can be preachers of, of the word, of the gospel, of peace, and, yeah, th- there's, um, I-, I feel so much, so much of the time, like, like Paul, talking about, I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things I want to do. But there, there is still hope, right? We still come back to this. We still come, come back, and, and, and what do we do when, when, we, when we see ourselves lacking? We can, we can ask God to help grow us, and, and we can also come to our, our brothers and sisters that are, that are more spiritually mature than us and, and ask them, how, how, do we, you know, how do we grow? Ask them for, for advice. So our, our kind of uh, question, application questions there, basically, are, are, we, are you happy? Are you happy? Is this, is this where you find your joy is, is in, in the Lord? Do, do you have that, that spiritual growth that, that comes from hungering, from feeding on righteousness? And, and are you prepared for, for persecution? So if, if this, you know, again, if, this is, if these are things that, that uh, don't describe your, your life, you know, the, the, these are, are things that, um, yeah, th- th- this is a process. This is a sanctification process. When we come, we start coming to the Lord poor in spirit as a beggar to the Lord. We, that we're, it's not a, a snap our fingers and, and all of a sudden we're there, right? But th- it starts and it begins. But it, if we haven't ever come to the Lord as, you know, destitute saying, Lord, have, have pity on me, the sinner, then that, that is the, the first step in, in, in this, this process. And I would, I would encourage you that today can, can be that day. And, and we can rejoice together over another soul being added to the kingdom of God.